Now, good evening. We do welcome you from the League of Women Voters and the Columbia Public Library to the Hybrid Candidate Forum. My name is David Lyle. I get the opportunity to be the moderator tonight, and we also want to thank KFRU and KOPN, two local radio stations that are broadcasting tonight's event live. We're going to focus on four different races, and they're all different and have their different um, responsibilities and we'll have their different atmosphere and environment and so it's going to be an interesting night. We'll move pretty quickly. Well basically this is not going to be especially for our four group because first group because we have three candidates the other groups will be at two candidates so we'll give a little bit longer to this first group that I'll introduce in just a moment but around a half an hour for each of our panels tonight and what we'll do is give them an opportunity, the candidates, to introduce themselves and then we'll uh, ask some questions that have been provided by the League of Women Voters. And then we'll have questions from our audience that is live here at the Columbia Public Library. Or if you're watching on Zoom, you can use the chat part of Zoom and those questions will be handed to me. So let's uh, tell you again, we're focusing on primary contested races. The Republican nomination for Boone County Presiding Commissioner, we'll get to that later this evening. Democratic nomination for Boone County Recorder of Deeds. Democratic nomination for Associate Circuit Judge in Division 10. And the Democratic nomination for Missouri State Representative District 47. Now the winners of these nominations will go on to have opponents in the November 8th election, except in the judicial contest, because the winner of the Democratic primary in that judicial race will be the next judge because there is no Republican candidate. We're gonna have candidate forums. Uh, we anticipate those in October for the general election races. We always appreciate the League of Women Voters and the library for hosting these events. So first of all, today, we're going to do the Democratic candidates for Boone County Recorder of Deeds. The candidates are Shannon Martin, Bob Nolte, Nick Knoth. The winner of this race is going to face Republican candidate Shaman Jones in November. Now the recorder of deeds is responsible for making a record of documents primarily in real estate and the issuance of marriage licenses. In addition, uniform commercial code, military discharge papers, tax liens, and miscellaneous documents may be recorded upon request and in compliance with statutes. So as we begin tonight, each candidate is going to have two minutes for an opening statement and then we'll have questions that the League has provided. We'll take any questions that our participants have, and uh, then we'll wrap it up with a final minute given to each of the candidates for a wrap-up comment. We're going to start with our opening comments, the two-minute introduction comments, in the order that they are on the ballot, and then reverse that for the final comments. So <coughs> let's begin by uh, welcoming tonight Shannon Martin. Thank you for being here, and your opening two minutes, please. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm Shannon Martin. I'm born and raised Boone County, six generations. I grew up in Hallsville, graduated from high school from there, attended Columbia College here as an evening student while going to work full time. I am the only candidate that currently works in the recorder's office. So I've spent all day there today and then to come here tonight to be with you. I've been a deputy recorder since 2018. I know what the recorder's office does. I know what's expected from the recorder's office. And I know how much pride I feel from working in the recorder's office. We just heard about some of the general responsibilities the recorder's office handles. And I do those on a daily basis. Today I've spent the day recording documents and issuing marriage license. I am the one solely responsible for putting those tax liens on people's properties. Not always the funnest thing, but you get to, <laughs> to, to see some, some stuff. Lately, we've been uh, doing a huge amount of certified marriage license to be real ID compliant. So if you've gotten your real ID, you've been in to see us, and we've issued thousands of those in the past three years. And by 2023, that will take full effect to have that star put on your driver's license. All right, thank you, Shannon Martin. Now our next candidate for, I better turn this on, right? Sorry. <laughs> Maybe I'll just leave that on, it'll be quiet while it's not, uh, while I'm not talking. Um, our uh, next candidate for Recorder of Deeds, Boone County, Bob Knowlton, you may present your opening remarks. 
Thank you, David. And thank you to the league for hosting us tonight. I'm Bob Nolte, uh, running to serve as your recorder of deeds. Uh, as David talked about, the recorder's office manages the documentation of real estate transactions, issues marriage licenses, all the things Shannon does on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I want to talk about Betty Johnson, who spent her, la her 36 years as our Boone County Recorder of Deeds. Um, she really brought the office into um, being a modernized office, made it a leader in the county, uh, and recently she has endorsed me. She believes that my experience uh, makes me qualified to lead this office to continue uh, the tradition of excellence that they've had as a recorder's office. I spent the last 10 years almost working at the University of Missouri. I was the director of compliance in the athletic department. So in that role, I interpreted legislation and we put in place policies and procedures to make sure we were meeting that legislation. I think those administrative skills uh, will interact great with the recorder's office, with making sure that everything is recorded correctly. Um, I'm very, very excited to work with the staff there. They have a great staff, um, and I want to be on their team and lead them into the future. Thank you, Bob Nolte. Our third candidate for this position is Nick Knoth, and we'd like to hear your opening remarks. Thank you, David. Uh, and thank you to the League and the Library for hosting us this evening. Uh, my name is Nick Knoth. Uh, I am also a candidate running for Recorder of Deeds, the most sought after office in Boone County, <laughs> to everyone's surprise, including all three of us, I'm sure. Uh, a little bit about myself, personally first, uh, so you can understand my perspective and where I've come from. Uh, I'm not originally from Boone County. Uh, I mostly was raised and born and raised in Southern Illinois, kind of the metro east of St. Louis, for those of you who know that area. Uh, raised by a single mother as youngest of three children. My childhood consisted of many of the staples of American poverty, uh, including evictions, uh, food insecurity, and uh, domestic violence, to name a few. Uh, I'm incredibly fortunate to have come up through all that and be here with you all today, but I'm also very conscious uh, of how that happened. Uh, it wasn't just through hard work, and there was certainly luck, and a whole community of folks, especially teachers who believed in me along the way uh, and supported me, uh, even going so far as to pay for my college application fees so that I could become a first-generation college student uh, when I came here to go to the University of Missouri. Uh, as a first-generation college student, I earned my degrees in political science and history, uh, as well as certificates in multicultural studies uh, and multi multicultural studies in American constitutional democracy. Uh, in college and since, I have spent my entire career uh, working in and around government at all levels. Uh, that includes time in Congress, our state legislature, uh, and most recently spending the last few years working directly with the majority of our municipalities here in Boone County and county government itself on a range of issues. I'm running for Boone County Government and Recorder of Deeds Office because I believe that my combination of my personal and professional experience is a perfect fit for this office. It provides a very fundamental service and that is vital to citizens regardless when they realize it. We're talking about our land, our homes often, and really at the end of the day we're talking about our generational wealth and well-being. Uh, I am fortunate to say I'm not alone in my belief that my uh, experience fits this position. I have received over 20 endorsements uh, from community leaders and elected officials throughout Boone County, including our Columbia City Council persons, Andrea Weiner and Matt Pitzer, as well as Columbia School Board members, Catherine Sasser and Blake Willoughby, and the mayors of Hallsville, Centralia, and Rocheport. Uh, again, I'm Nick Knoth, and I look forward to answering all the questions tonight. Thank all right. you. Nick Knoth, thank you. Now, I want to remind you, if you have questions for these candidates, the recorder of deed candidates, then uh, you can Raise your hand if you have those uh, questions written out or the questions on your index cards. And if you're listening to us on Zoom or following us that way, use the chat to communicate and we will uh, ask your questions. Nick, since you uh, made a comment at the beginning of your opening statement about how this is the most coveted position in Boone County, I want to pick up on that for a second because one of the questions that I wrote this afternoon was, I don't know of any kids who have said, when I grow up, I want to be a recorder of deeds. <laughs> We're going to start with Shannon on this one, then to go to Bob and Nick, and we'll alternate who gets to answer first in the succeeding questions. But for Shannon Martin, so why recorder of deeds? Um, I came on board uh, four years ago, and from the very beginning, I walked into the vault and was so amazed by those records and how well they've been kept for over 200 years. I want to be part of that. I want to take those records, preserve them, show them off, and let everyone come in and see that they are available. All of those records are still available for you to look at 
at, right there in, I mean, they're, they're beautiful. You walk through there, they're, they're written, and they started with the one book, and we've just gone all the way up. Today, we finished book number 5,649 wow. books. We did that today. So tomorrow, we'll start 5,650, and they are all available. I am so thrilled to be part of this. That's what I love. That's where I work, and I just want to go to the next level with this. I want to just ask a clarification. What is a book? What do you mean by a book? A book is um, every individual record that is kept by the recorder's office. One document comes in, we record it. It's recorded in a book. When uh, 200 documents fill the book, we go to the next book and continues on and on. And so they started way back in the day with book number one. Actually not. They book started A and they went to 26 and then they're like, what do we do now? <laughs> so they went to one and now we're up to 5,649. Thank you. Bob Nolte, kids don't say I want to be a recorder of deeds. So when they uh, start out thinking about potential jobs, why are you seeking this job? Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the only uh, politically elected positions I've considered, and that's because it matches my professional experience. This is a chance for me to take those skills that I've learned over the last almost decade serving student athletes, coaches, administrators, university professor professionals, uh, and transition that into serving all of Boone County. Uh, I am enthusiastic about protecting those documents uh, and want to make sure that we have them for years and years to come. Uh, I was in the office the other day looking at something in my property, uh, and as Shannon said, it is, it is spectacular to be in that uh, vault to look through those old records, literally touching history. Uh, I was a, a history major in college, wanted to teach history and just the awe that you feel in those records. I want to, I want to protect those. And uh, now I ask the same question for Nick Knoth, and I want to say to all of the candidates who will come up here later and, and to our candidates, our uh, listeners online are, are asking, don't rush, speak slowly. <laughs> <laughs> they want to hear what you have to say. All right, so why recorder? I am a government nerd. Uh, that, that is the simplest way to put it. I have spent my entire a career, again, both in my personal and professional life, uh, working around government, uh, and I have seen this office, and I just see an incredible opportunity for this office to not just continue the legacy of uh, Betty Johnson and Nora Dietzel as she retires, but to really build on it and evolve it into what it needs to be in the 21st century, whether that's through modernizing processes, ensuring equitable access, or for the position of a quarter itself to evolve and become more than just a bureaucrat or an administrator, which it is foundationally, but it can be so much more. Uh, and I think going, as we've seen in the last uh, decade, let alone the last few years, we need more uh, of our elected officials and we should expect more and we should get that. Uh, and that's why I'm running. We'll go to one of the questions. And some of these questions I, I think are going to be, you're gonna say, well, I've already answered this, but let's um, we give you a chance to ask, answer them in a different way perhaps. And this is one of the questions from the league. Which of your qualifications do you want to emphasize for the voters? And this time we'll start with Bob Nolte. I'd like to emphasize um, my ability to lead a team. So I've been part of great teams working at the university, um, not just sports teams, but within the athletic department, within our <coughs> compliance office. Um, so being able to effectively manage folks, to lead them forward, to make sure that People are getting the best possible they can when they come to work. It's you know, something that you spend a whole lot of time doing. It may not always be enjoyable, um, but we can find ways to make sure that people are um, feeling appreciated, um, have ways to grow, have them transition into additional responsibilities. So I want to, again, emphasize that team leadership, making sure that um, the next recorder is working with the staff to move them forward. Same question, and that question is, which of your qualifications do you want to emphasize for the voters? Nick Cano? My ability to build bridges and work with a very diverse uh, community. In my previous positions, I have built partnerships and task forces across counties and across communities and within communities, uh, ranging from groups like the NAACP to home builders to realtors to small businesses and nonprofits. And that is a perfect fit for this office. This office works with everybody. Everybody from developers to an individual who is uh, unbeknownst to them suddenly inheriting a property that they need help deeding to themselves. 
uh, I have done this, and, and that is representative in my endorsements. It's not, you know, those endorsements are not uh, something to brag about, but rather a, an example of my proven track record of working with all of these communities in our, in our county, in which we are very diverse, over 700 square miles, almost 200,000 people. <clears throat> We're diverse within Columbia. We're even more diverse within this county. Uh, and I've done that, and I will continue doing it in this position. And again, I'll repeat the question. What a, which of your qualifications do you want to emphasize for the voters? Shannon Martin? Um, I think it's clear that I have a four-year head start on training. These guys are going to have to start at the bottom and work up. And I can start where I am and build. I already have a super relationship with the team. I, I come here tonight with their full support. And I'll be able to step into that role with them already backing me and knowing that this is the person that they want to take over. Let's go to another question from the league, and we'll start with Nick on answering this one. What changes would you like to see in the Recorder of Deeds office? Yes, uh, so my two priorities for the office, which touched on this, is, is to modernize processes and uh, ensure equitable access to all of our records and services. Modern process is more straightforward. We're talking about embracing technology, uh, whether that's by putting more services online, uh, digitizing records, or using modern technology uh, more in the office itself. Uh, equitable access is my passion and a big reason why I'm running. Uh, the office itself is inherently uh, inaccessible and, and inequitable. Uh, it is only accessible in its downtown location, the County Government Services Building, uh, 9 to 5, or 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. And again, we're a diverse community. We need to expand those hours, and we need to go to the people, like our county clerk does, like our county collector does, to give folks the opportunity to use the services they pay for conveniently. Because again, we're a large county, and even within Columbia, we don't exactly have the best transit system uh, to get around uh, and for people to access the government services that they pay for, whether or not they can get to it. All right, and Shannon Martin is next on the question, what changes would you like to see in the Recorder of Deeds office? The first thing that I'd like to um, address is with iCounty. They wrote our software for us. I know Dave Mudd, and I've worked with him in the past. That program was written years ago, and I do believe that it just needs to be revisited to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, it, it's a great, it's a great program, and even one of our current um, deputies actually helped write that program. That program is now used in a lot of other counties, not just us, but I think it's old, and I think it needs to have some updates done to it to make it um, going into the future. Again, I apologize for asking that this just to one specific, but what is iCounty? iCounty is the company that wrote the program. It's the program that you that use? That we use, it's very specific to recording documents. Okay, and um, finally on this particular question, what changes would you like to see in the Recorder of Deeds Office, Bob Milton? So my priorities, making sure we're um, protecting those records, providing secure access to them, uh, as well as continuing to provide great customer service for folks to come in the office. Um, but additional thing I think the recorder's office can do is providing education to the public. Uh, it's something that I did in my role at Mizzou, where I was educating coaches, student athletes, and the public. Um, but people need to know about the services offered. So for example, uh, you can sign up with iCounty to have notifications for when there's a change in your title. Uh, we also want to let people know about HB 1662, which allows people with racially restrictive covenants to have them removed from their deeds. Um, so going out into the public, making sure people are aware of how to access these resources um, in the office, online, however that may be, uh, but really educating about what the recorders does. Um, I've tried to do that through my campaign, both on the doors and on our social media. This question is kind of a follow-up, and it, you, at least two of you and maybe all three have spoken about how, um, how wonderful it is to walk into this place and have these books. And it's like you can smell and see and touch. If you modernize an office like that and digitize it, aren't you losing that romanticism of, uh, of real documents? And I guess we'll go in the same order we just did since it's kind of related to your answers, Nick. Uh, no, you're absolutely not, uh, because we would not be destroying physical copies. We would really be digitizing uh, those, as Shannon said, as the office consistently works on, but really prioritizing it uh, to ensure both redundancy and things of that nature, whether it's security or, or making things easier to access online. Uh, so no, I, I don't think you'd be losing that, because the, the vault would still be there. We'd still have physical records, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure that has to be a state statute, uh, by my knowledge. 
Um, but it would, again, security and access would be improved. I guess I'm a Luddite. Um, go ahead, uh, Shannon, <laughs> your answer to the same question. We get a lot of phone calls about people that want to search the records from home. That maybe they don't have the access to get to us. Uh, they live in Centralia and don't drive, and they need to read those records. And every day in some downtime, if you call it, we don't have much, but we, we work on those records, and we add page after page after page, hand entering all of those records, double checking, triple checking, and making sure all the information that as they are in the old books are put on the computer. It's not ideal, but I mean, it is technology and that's where our, our lives are all headed. Everybody wants to be able to see those. And, uh, but they still call us and they wanna know how to search. And we still have to talk them through how to search and how to sign up. Um, but everything is still there. All the records are still available. Appreciate it. Bob Nolte, a final comment on this one? Yeah, so having just done this for my property, um, I would have loved to be able to do as much as possible from my home, um, but at some point you do, might, you do have to go in. Uh, I don't think we necessarily lose that awe. Um, it, we just want to make it more efficient for um, getting the records that you need, um, whether it's historical research, whether it's um, trying to prove what land was owned when, um, making sure that those are available and accessible online. Um, I don't think it really takes away from that. Uh, in person all. Thank you all for humoring me. Uh, here's a question from one of the audience members and Shannon Martin, you're first on this. The question as written, how do people justify paying a new county employee $90,000 a year versus 14 to $16 an hour simply because the first job mentioned is elected? Um, both people need to learn the job. Why is there such an inequity in salary? has to do, I, I think they're taking aim at the salary of a reporter in Deans. <laughs> I think there's a huge learning process. So to stick someone in to this position, making that type of money is kind of insane. Um, it is a manageable, managing position. They managed six employees. That's a huge undertaking. And um, they do need to be recognized for that. It is an upper level position. It's an elected official position. We don't really know why because of how it all started years ago. But um, yeah, I mean, definitely there has to be some sort of a variance between the two because if you're a manager, then yes, and you're an elected official, you've been chosen by the people of the county. I do believe there needs to be a different salary for that and not starting out at the $14 to $16 an hour range. Bob Nolte? So the reason the recorder is elected is the way Missouri state statutes are set up. So when a county becomes a second class county, it becomes big enough to need a separate recorder um, from the clerk of the court. That's when it becomes an elected official. Uh, I think the all, all of the elected officials make the same pay because they're expected to manage the offices they're in charge of, they're expected to um, participate in all of the duties of an elected official, um, and are, are treated the same. Um, I think it's important, like Shannon said, to have um, people with management experience and people who have started in roles similar to the deputy recorder. So when I started at Mizzou, was in a customer-facing administrative role, um, but I was able to move up from that was promoted, wound up training that replacement, and then managing them. So having that experience, uh, I think, really does dictate that additional payment. Nick Canoth, your, your thought? So I don't think there is an issue with the pay that the elected recorder of each receives. Again, as was mentioned, their pay is the same as most of the other countywide elected officials. Uh, and really, that is appropriate given its uh, administrative duties and leadership position, especially if you put it in the uh, scope of the private sector, it is uh, far less. Um, I think the real thing that we should look at and pay attention to in that question, as I've talked about on the campaign trail, uh, and I'm, I don't think I'm alone on this, our, our county is uh, known for its poor wages, um, comparatively. Uh, and it is impressive that our county staff and uh, the folks who actually do the hard work do such an incredible job uh, for relatively uh, poor pay compared to their, especially their private sector peers. Uh, fortunately, the Boone County Commission is issuing a retention bonus uh, this year to help keep employees, and I believe they're doing a pay scale study to help raise those wages. Uh, I'm very happy to see that. It's a step in the right direction. 
Uh, and so I, I, what I want to say is I think the issue should be less with what our elected officials are paid and more that our staff are not paid enough uh, and that we need to raise their wages. Bob Nolte, you get first on this next question. How much does party affiliation matter in every quarter of deeds, race, or office? Uh, I've gotten this question a lot on the door. So in addition to why is this elected, um, but really what makes you a Democrat and why are you running as a Democrat? Uh, I think it speaks to my values. You know how I will uh, interact in the office. Uh, I have been a longtime Democratic volunteer, so I've knocked probably close to 5,000 doors for other uh, Democratic candidates, um, have been involved in the party. So the, it, it speaks to the values. It speaks to how I will do the job, um, you know, respecting the employees in the office, but also interacting with our other elected officials um, working with them on how we can move Boone County forward overall. Nick Knoth? Can you repeat the question? Sure. How much does the party affiliation matter in the recorder of deeds race or in the running of that office? So I would say to the question of how much does it matter, it depends on who you're talking to. Uh, I would argue that it shouldn't matter at all. Uh, all of our countywide positions should be nonpartisan uh, because really what we want is qualified uh, people who are dedicated to good government and providing the best service for our tax dollars. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the reality we live in. Uh, these are partisan positions due to uh, our state constitution and the uh, class of county that we are. Uh, and in that capacity, it was a no-brainer uh, to choose to run as a Democrat, um, and, to, and to Bob's point, uh, partially because of values, right? Uh, I think there would be a lot of folks who would agree that uh, one party has of late, uh, let's say, put it lightly, lost its way. <laughs> uh, and so in terms of uh, choosing a party affiliation and going off my past experience, again, for me, growing up as a poor kid who uh, only you know, was able to go to college because of uh, government grants and services and even was fed and went to school, uh, thanks to government, I am uh, never going to hesitate to be a Democrat. <laughs> Shannon Martin, same question for you. You're speaking from having experience in the office. I'm going to go at a customer service base. Whether one person walks in with one document or a title company comes in with 50, we're going to treat them exactly the same from beginning to end, period. Let us go to another question then. And again, if you have any questions, our time is almost up for this particular panel that we have of four tonight. I would like to ask, and I'll start with Nick Knoth on this, what have you learned about voters while campaigning for this race? Uh, I think the number one thing I've learned from voters is that they are, as I think a lot of folks are nowadays, uh, increasingly overwhelmed uh, by our politics. Uh, and uh, I'll also add as a kind of a tangent that many are unaware or were and are becoming increasingly aware that there is an election coming up August 2nd. There are three people running for reporter of deeds and it is a position that you vote for. Uh, and, and the reason we haven't had to think about that, which is a good thing for the most part, is that it hasn't truly been an open and competitive office in 50 years uh, because Betty Johnson's tenure was very long in there, followed by Nora Dietzel. Uh, and so we just haven't had to worry about that, which again is a good thing. Um, but I'd say, again, people are, people are stressed. That's what I've learned from voters. And what they're looking for uh, are, are safe bets, sane people who have the proper experience and you know, are going to do both a good job uh, and be conscious of uh, the diversity in our community, let alone our very large county. Shannon Martin, the same question to you. What have you learned about voters? I have learned that people are looking for kindness and being nice. And I know politics don't really go that route, but if you can take an extra mile and you can talk to someone and you can smile at them and you can kind of understand what they're going through, spend a couple of minutes with them, that's what people want these days. They don't want the negativity that comes out of this race. They want someone who can pump them up and be positive and shake their hands and, and walk their, their walk with them. And that's what I think people want in this day and age. Bob Nolte, it's your turn. What have you learned about the voters while campaigning? I'll, I'll echo both parts. They want kindness. Um, they want to not have to worry about whether their deed is going to be uh, stolen by somebody, whether there's going to be an issue. They want to trust that the recorder, even though they don't think about it all the time, is always there working for them. They want to know that they're being protected, uh, and they want great customer service when they come into the office because that's usually 
a really important time in their life, whether they're getting married uh, or there's a death in the family and they need something to go to probate. So making sure that um, they're being provided those services, um, they just they, they don't want to have to think about it the way that we three have had to think about why we want to do this position. Shannon Martin will be first on this one. What would you tell those that are in the recorder's office now, the workers that are in that office now, to expect if you're elected? They can expect um, that I am going to show up for Boone County. I will be present in the office. I will, I will take care of them. I know them. I've worked with all of them. We have one who's been there 35 years. The next 10, 8, 2 at 4, uh, 1 at 8. Um, we have longevity. And that takes um, working together as a team. Not putting myself above them, but working beside them. And when times get busy, I'm going to be right there at that counter doing the same job that I do currently. I'm going to take care of them. All right, same question. What would you tell those in the recorder's office working there now to expect if you're elected Bob Milty? Similar to Shannon, I'm going to be standing shoulder to shoulder with them, making sure the work is being done, showing up every single day uh, and working hard like I've done the last almost decade at Mizzou. Uh, we're going to work together to find ways to improve. I'm going to listen. I'm going to make sure that their ideas are being heard and that they're being advocated for. Um, we talked about pay inequality. We need to you know, pay them more. I'm going to be the one that's going to advocate for increases. I'm going to be the one that's standing there, again, shoulder to shoulder with them um, at the beginning, learning the work, eventually uh, pitching in where I can and making sure that that office is run as efficiently and effectively as possible. Nick Canoth, your answer to the question? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll echo what my uh, two compatriots have said. You know, I'm going to support them. Uh, at the end of the day, in every single office, it's the staff who is doing uh, the most thankless work in our county is in any level of government and as somebody who's with the Korean government I am very well aware of that uh, they are the experts and I'm going to support them ensure they have their resources uh, the staffing and the pay and everything of that nature uh, and also to congratulate them on having done a tremendous job and put Boone County in as one of the best recorded deeds offices in this state uh, but I'm also going to challenge them uh, that there is room for improvement uh, and that is not an attack that is not a negative thing um, you know, Betty Johnson served for about 40 years. If I'm elected and I serve for 50 years uh, and some young man or woman comes after me and says we can do better, uh, I will be happy to hear that because we should always be continuously improving our services and what government does uh, on behalf of the taxpayers. And so I will challenge our staff and myself included in that as, as a member of the team uh, to say, okay, <coughs> what can we do better, you know, based on your experience. We're going to go to the uh, closing comments now and again. These are three candidates. Democratic side, they will have a Republican who is not engaged in a primary, but the winner of the primary election early August from this group of three will represent the Democrats on the ballot for recorder of deeds <coughs> for Boone County. So closing comments, those are a minute each, if you choose to take that, and we'll reverse the order from what we did in the opening comments. This would be reverse order as the names appear for this race on the ballot. So Nick Canoth, your closing remarks. So again, I have spent my career working in government. I've seen the best of it, and I've certainly seen the worst of it. I, I've been a recipient uh, in times of need uh, and, in time, and in good times of government services. Uh, I am running on my, the combination of my extensive government experience. Uh, and, and on top of that, I'm a licensed realtor and notary, which for an office that 90% of its dealings are around real estate transactions uh, is particularly relevant. Uh, I am not. Uh, asking anyone to take just take my word for it again I have received uh, two dozen endorsements from local community leaders and elected officials from the mayors of towns outside of Columbia to our city council persons and school board members and that is again uh, proof in my opinion of my track record of actually getting things done of uh, bringing people together and, and solving problems and ensuring good government service uh, that is what I'm bringing to the table uh, I want to push this office uh, into its next chapter to evolve uh, and to become what I think and believe the citizens of Boone County need it to be. Thank you, Nick Canoth. And now, Bob Nolte, your closing remarks. <clears throat> I want to reiterate my excitement for working with the great staff that we have in the recorder's office. Uh, I want to 
help them, make them better, have them make me better, uh, and really work towards a uh, increase uh, in the ability that the recorder's office has to provide that great service that is expected by Boone County citizens. Uh, I'm thoroughly prepared to win this race in November and then prepared as well to serve as recorder uh, if elected. I want to make sure that citizens trust their recorder, they know that their documents are being protected, and they know that if there is an issue, uh, the recorder and the staff are going to work really hard to help them out to make sure it gets solved. Again, I'm Bob Nolte. Thank you all for your time tonight. Shannon Martin, your closing remarks, please. I just want to add a few more numbers. In 2021, during the height of the pandemic, the recorder's office recorded 36,000 documents. No additional staff, no backlog. Every document that was brought into that office by walk-in, by electronic record, or by mail was processed that very same day. That's how outstanding we are. And I have been a part of that, and I will continue to be a part of that service that we provide to Boone County. How about it? Let's uh, thank our Democratic candidates for Boone County Recorder of Deeds. We are back at the uh, Columbia Public Library where they are making it possible not only for us to have a room for the live audience in regard to our candidate forum tonight, but also making it possible that we could Zoom so that those of you who choose not to be here or who cannot be here are uh, able to participate. And again, if you have questions that you want to ask of our candidates, and this is our second of four panels that we will have, then make sure you use that chat and uh, we will be able to uh, do the questions because they will be provided to me. And if you're listening on the radio stations, we also appreciate KFRU and KOPN with the radio coverage tonight. Did you two just meet? How about that? We need more candidate forms for the uh, August <laughs> primaries, don't we? Um, I, the, what I was asking is the two candidates for the Republican side of the Boone County Presiding Commissioner, the Boone County Commission is an elected three-member governing body it has a District 1 or a Southern Commissioner, a District 2 Northern Commissioner, and a Presiding Commissioner. The Commission establishes county policy, approves and adopts the annual budget for all county operations, approves actual expenditures for each department, supervises the operations of public works, planning and zoning, building codes, human resources, purchasing information technologies and facilities and grounds maintenance. They also so ensure countywide compliance with numerous statutory requirements and act as liaisons with county boards, commissions, and other governmental entities. Why would anybody have time to do all of that? <laughs> Republican candidates are Connie Leopard and James Pounds. The winner of this contest will have a Democratic candidate to go against in November. That's Kip Kendrick. Each candidate is going to have a two-minute opening statement followed by some of the questions. If you were listening a while ago, it's the same routine that we did through the Recorder of Deeds. And the League of Women Voters have provided some questions. We'll also have some questions from the in-person audience and Zoom questions. For our in-person audience, there are note cards on the chairs. If you have already used those or need new ones, let us know and uh, the League will get those to you. So after we have the opening comments of two minutes each, up to two minutes, then each candidate will be given one minute to answer each question, and then there'll be a one minute closing statement time. Candidates will give their opening statements in ballot order, and then we'll reverse that for the closing statement. So, Connie Leppard, welcome, and we'd like to hear your opening remarks. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to the League for inviting us here this evening, and thank you, David, for being our moderator. I am a woman in construction, a small business owner of 40 plus years here in Boone County, and a committed volunteer to multiple local, regional, and national nonprofit boards with executive leadership experience. So as to why you would want to do this job, I've already, I'm already doing a lot of work. So I appreciate the fact that our commission is committed to this community and to this county. I appreciate the fact that our citizens are engaged and want to know what the commission is doing. 
As a volunteer on the NAWIC National Board, I served as the national president of the National Association of Women in Construction, where I currently serve as their national parliamentarian. I received years of training in the legal and fiduciary responsibilities for boards and commissions, as well as strategic planning and organizational management. That is all training and experience that will serve you well. I've served since 2019 on the Boone County Children's Services Board, which is a commission appointed position within the county. So I'm already plugged into county business there and serving you very, very well. As a construction, woman in construction with my experience in interpreting plans and specifications, as well as contract document specialists, those are all transferable skills that will serve you very well in planning and zoning and uh, infrastructure, roads, and bridges. So thank you for asking <coughs> questions this evening. I look forward to answering them. Thank you. James Pounds, your opening remarks, please. Good evening. Thanks to the League of Women Voters and the Library for having us. And I uh, only have one slight criticism. Of, uh, you know, we want to have a nonpartisan, all these county offices are nonpartisan. Why don't we invite all the candidates to go and participate in these debates instead of going and just having the Republicans or the Democrats? I mean, what what's the issue with that? Why can't we do that? But on to the reason why I'm wanting to run for county commissioner is because I think that the county commission has the greatest control over on over controlling the cost of building in Boone County. It has a, the greatest control over our taxation. It has the greatest control over our scope and detail of property. And that is the reason why I want to serve on a county commission. I think that it's been poorly managed over the years, and I think it, we need to have a see a change. And I'd like to have somebody there on a county commission that uh, understands what affordable housing is and why we don't have any in Boone County. And my reason for that is, is because the county commission they absorb, they adopt, they comply with every building code, every every uh, code that comes out, and the building codes in this country are wrote on the East Coast, and that works great for the East Coast, but we're not the East Coast. And the reason why we need to go and change some of this stuff is that uh, we, it's costing us. It costs us a bunch of money. It, when it costs when you add scope and detail to a project you add cost to it and that's part of the problem that's why we are in the, in the shape that we're in in Boone County and that's why and it affects the poor and the elderly the worse because their taxes go up it costs more money you can finish your thought it costs more money to build to if it costs more it costs me more money to build a house then the taxes are increased and it's, the insurance is increased, the sales tax, everything across the board. You add scope and detail to a project, everything goes up to it. On it. And that I don't think we've had anybody on the county commission for decades that have any understanding of what they have done to Boone County and why it has become so expensive to build in Boone County and why there is no affordable housing in Boone County. Let's end it there because I think you're going to have a chance in some follow-up questions to expand on that idea if you choose to. I will say that the league will hold forums of contested races and whoever wins your race will be invited to participate in an October forum against the Democratic candidate. I, I think I, I get your idea and it kind of picks up on what the recorder of deed candidates were saying, which is why not make this nonpartisan? With that in mind, then I'll ask, and Connie Leppard, you're first on the first question. How would, um, um, how would the, uh, a, a Republican presiding commissioner govern the county differently than a Democrat? The govern differently, the, the commission is, is as are their authority by state statute. My personal opinion, it has nothing to do with the political party. It's about your professional experience, your leadership experience. I have executive leadership experience. And Boone County is a very, very diverse county with multiple types of people and multiple income levels. And we need 
the commission focused on the whole of the county, which that's why I said I believe that the commission is. We're fo focused on the whole of the county, and it really should have nothing to do with what political party you're affiliated with. It's about the job, keeping that job, responsibilities, being dedicated to that job, showing up every day, working very, very hard. And your fiduciary responsibilities that I've been trained on is you set aside your personal opinion on many issues to focus on what's in the best interest of the whole of the county, which is exactly what I would do. James Pound, same question about the uh, difference of a Republican presiding commissioner governing the county differently than a Democrat. Well, um, since Kate Snar, we've had a, we've had a, a uh, Democrat as presiding commissioner other than Keith Snar for three decades. And I think that uh, part of the problem is, is I think Democrats think just a little bit differently than Republicans do. Um, I think I'm, and the reason why I identify as a, as a uh, Republican is I'm more physically conservative. Um, I look for ways that we can go and save money and go and keep from uh, increasing the cost of living in Boone County and making it where the poor and the elderly have a place to live. I want them to be included in our community. I don't want them to be, you know, bought out. I don't want them to be forced out of Boone County because of cost. And our property taxes have gone up. Uh, our insurance has gone up on these houses. The cost of building these houses has gone up. Uh, that's, that's where I stand on it. James Pounds, you'll be first to answer this question. And I think it, it's, it's going to follow up very nicely with what you've already presented to us this evening. But I want to give you this question from the league. What is the greatest challenge facing the Boone County Commission? And what action do you propose for meeting that challenge? Perhaps you've presented what you think is a major challenge. It has to do with cost of living and, and houses. Well, I mean, and, yeah, would... I agree. And just like today, I mean, I paid $5.09 a gallon for diesel uh, for my pickup and, you know, run my equipment. And, you know, it's got to the point now, I'm hoping that I've been preaching this for quite some time, but not now I'm hoping that now I'll be listened to, that we need to go and control government and make it where they don't look at every opportunity to raise our taxes and increase our cost of living in Boone County. I mean, I, I'm a strong opponent of that. Uh, you know, my grandmother and my grandfather, they had trouble, you know, paying their property taxes and things like that. And, you know, insurance has increased, property taxes increased, sales taxes have increased, and, and, you know, the root of all that is government. And as presiding commissioner, I think I would have the greatest effect as being able to control that and maybe even reduce it. Maybe, you know, of course, I'm just one person on a board of three, but I, I would start strongly be uh, an advocate for doing that. I want to follow up real quickly, if I may, and I'll give County Leopard the same opportunity should she choose to take it. But so, what to to bring in less or to reduce cost? Are you seeing that you could still provide the same services, or would things be cut? Well, to start with, I served on the Boone County Building Code Commission for several years, several different terms, and at every turn, I was voted down. We try, I tried to control costs on that, and I finally just, you know. When it came time to renew my my uh, membership on that board, I just let it go, and they uh, assigned David Weber to that position. And you know, uh, me and David have a completely different uh, view on how to operate codes and stuff like that. And you know, it, that's where it starts. It starts, you know, when you go and add rules and regulation, you increase rules and regulations to the point where, and add a bunch of cost and the scope and detail to these projects, be it building a house, building a road, building a commercial building, building a Wendy's, whatever it is. When you add scope and detail, it, uh, that's what it calls, I mean, it just adds cost. Uh, Connie Leopard, I'm gonna give you an extra time should you choose to take it. It is a two-part question, so sure. I think that's fine. What's the greatest challenge facing the Boone County Commission and what action do you propose for meeting that challenge? As a business owner and with executive leadership experience that I have, I'm always looking forward, and I know right now, and I agree with Jimmy on this point, on fiscal responsibility, that's why I am on the Republican ticket, because I do believe in, in fiscal 
responsibility, accountability, and transparency. And I will agree that I'm looking down the road. I know we're flush with cash right now and everybody feels really good, but we are in, have been in the construction industry for more than 10, more than the two years dealing with very high rates of inflation. We just received material cost increase notices again this week in our industry. I'm in the commercial industry sector. Those costs over time are going to eat into the county budget. There is no question. We are already dealing with workforce issues, which is going to increase wages. Our, our uh, county budget right now, if you look at the 2022 budget that was, that was prepared, one of the, the stipulations that, they were, that the budget was based on was that the, in, that the inflation would level out from last year and it has exploded. I believe looking forward, we've got to look at our fiscal responsibilities on what it's gonna look like if we hit into a hard recession. We don't know, but I can tell you that the experts were saying it was transitory. We could tell you in the construction industry dealing with it for two years, there was no way the inflation we were dealing with was transitory. So is it gonna be a hard landing or soft? I have no idea, I'm not an economist, but as a businesswoman, as a business owner in this county, I've lived through recessions that were very difficult. There's going to be difficult decisions to make, and I'm prepared to make those decisions. Did you give her two minutes? Okay. okay. We'll move on to another question from the league. And Connie Leppard, you're first on this. Leadership skills are essential for the role of presiding commissioner. What leadership skills and leadership experiences do you offer for this role? I think you've addressed some of these, and what prompts you to run for office at this time? As the National Association of Women in Construction president, I, I represented women from every sector of the construction industry, union, non-union, every discipline within the industry, north, south, east, west, Guam, Hawaii, Alaska, every ideology you can imagine. I was able to do that very successfully because I kept the eye on what the mission of our association was all about, and it was the people that you were serving. So executive leadership and being a leader on, on the commission, that's one of the things that excites me the most because you're able to, whatever is not within the authority of the commission to do, you because of the liaisons and all the different boards that you serve on, you're connected with the people. And I am so excited to be connected with the people. That's who I am. I've been to over 130 community events since mid-January because I love being with people, the whole county. And I, I will continue to do that. And that, I think, is executive leadership. I'm going to repeat the question for James Pounds. Leadership skills essential for the role of presiding commissioner. What leadership skills and leadership experiences do you offer for this role? And what prompts you to run for office at this time? <laughs> Well, as the uh, head janitor for James Pounds Construction, I go and monitor and, and uh, uh, do everything I can to go and save money to uh, make it where I can build affordable housing in Boone County. And it's very hard to do that. And uh, thankfully, my CEO gives me the, the uh, latitude to go and, and do that kind of stuff. And uh, that's the reason why I think uh, the problem with it is, I think you go and get into the executive uh, positions, is you don't you get to the point where you don't listen to the janitor, you don't listen to the people that are actually doing the job, and that's uh, not an issue for me because I do all of them. I wear all the hats down there, and uh, I'm you know I'm a very good uh, janitor. I do a very good job with that. And uh, I have done a very good job at saving James Pounds Construction's money uh, and uh, maintaining fiscal responsibility. This is a question that the recorder of deed candidates got. I'm going to rephrase it just a bit because I think this is maybe the gist of this question. It has to do with the salary. You are public, you're running for a public <coughs> office. It's pretty easy to find out what the salary is for presiding commissioner or sheriff or recorder of deeds. So the question as it was posed earlier was, how do you justify paying someone who is freshly employed as, in your case, presiding commissioner, the salary that you would get 
when you are newbies on the job and others who have been working for the county and other positions are maybe making 14 to $16 an hour. James Pounds, that's a question about the salaries that are paid to Kelly Fogan. Uh, could you go and repeat the opening line about the uh, <laughs> job description for presiding commissioner? Yeah. It's quite a little bit. It and it's a, and you have to put up with a lot of stuff and there's a lot of people that you have to deal with. Um, you know, and honestly, my position on that is, is if you got a complaint about what the county commissioner makes, then maybe you should run for office and see exactly how much fun it is to go and actually do that job. It's, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've known several of them and uh, they, they don't go and speak very favorably of it. And if anything, they probably feel that they're underpaid. <laughs> so that's how I feel about it. Thank you. Connie Leopard, same question. As a small business owner uh, that is on call almost 24 seven, that's the way I look at the commission office, the commissioners. I believe being plugged into the county, as you, as you mentioned, all of the, the duties of that office and what the commissioners have to do and should be doing, being engaged with the folks and being out among the whole entire county, that's a big job. And you should be engaged every single day with your constituents and on call, which that's why I have my phone number on my campaign materials, because I am that kind of a person that I would be working with 40 plus, 50 plus, 60 hours, which I'm used to. So, Candidate Pounds mentioned a moment ago something about the high price of diesel fuel and mm -hmm. other, and I think uh, Connie Leppard also mentioned something about the costs and where we are as far as inflation is concerned. This question goes to uh, Connie Leppard first. I mean, what kind of power does the Boone County Presiding Commissioner have over these issues of inflation and price? You don't. It's out of your control. But what you do have authority as a commission, you're one of three, so it's not the Presiding Commissioner by his or herself. It's the commission as a whole looks at the whole of the county budget, working with all of the county officials, looking at those costs, working with the purchasing departments, and doing the best job that they can and if if times require cutting that's what would happen because unlike the federal government the county does not have a printing press in the basement of the, the county building so it's obvious that we have to work within the budget that's provided to us by our our revenue james pound same question well i mean i connie's explained it very well i mean the you want somebody on the county commission that uh, is going to be looking at these budgets and you know asking these different department heads hey is there anything anything in your department that we can save money on and and it it's not just that it's just like when you go in like the road and bridge department you know the guy running the road grader he might have a pretty good idea that might be able to save the county money and nobody's listened to him maybe we ought to go and start talking to these people I mean, that are actually physically doing a job every day and see if we can learn something, learn a new way of doing something. Uh, that's where that's where I'm at. I, you know, I, I, uh, I don't have any problem with uh, getting dirty. Uh, it's just part of the job. And I think that's what this job needs. It needs somebody that's actually hands-on, that doesn't sit in the office down there at the county building and get out and talk to people. James Pounds will be first on this question. Um, it kind of hits on some of the things we've been talking about. How well do you know the Northern Commissioner and the Southern Commissioner, and how do you think you'd get along with them and working as one of three? Oh, I think I'd get along really good with them. I mean, I, I think I'm probably, they're, they're probably secret fans of mine. And I'm, <laughs> I'm probably, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if I don't get a vote or two from either one. <laughs> Right, Jenny? <laughs> <laughs> One of the commissioners. Now, Jenny, for those now, who are now, listening now. by uh, Remember, radio or Jenny, by Zoom. Jimmy and, and Martini, you get Martini? <laughs> County Leopard, how well do you know the Northern and Southern commissioners, and how do you anticipate working with them? Actually, I know them very well. I've been attending the commission meetings since mid-January. I think I've missed four. So I've been uh, observing how the commission works and the, the business that's brought before the commission. I've also worked, uh, Janet is, I'm on the Boone County Children's Services Board and she's the commission liaison to that board. And we've had numbers of conversations on multiple things over the years. 
Um, so Justin, I'm getting to know. I, I haven't known him for very long, but but I, I know them all very well and we'll get along just fine. Um, only time for maybe one other question and then we'll go to the closing comments. Connie Leopard first on this one. Other than what you've talked about so far, could be roads, it could be public safety, it could be Columbia, Boone County relations, it could be more about development or public health. Prioritize one or two of those in a short answer and tell us, just pick one of those topics and address it as far as where that would fit into your priorities as a presiding commissioner. I'll pick public safety is a big issue and it falls into workforce because 911 center is down folks right now um, and, and sometimes that's not just money sometimes there's shift work that are involved so there's barriers to folks applying and being um, being able to be hired in the position because of child care issues there's a lot of peripheral things that could be a barrier for folks to work in some of those those jobs but i would Public safety and and also uh, infrastructure. I believe it's really big. Broadband expansion across the county is huge. It just was something that came up during the pandemic that was an issue for kids being able to uh, log in on computers for classes, and that became a really big issue uh, for the county. James Pounds, you're, other than what you've already addressed as the main concerns and what your priorities are, Choose one or two of these roads, public safety, Columbia, Boone County relations, development or public health as a priority for you as presiding commissioner. Building codes and development. I, I think we can make a vast improvement in both those areas. I think there's a lot of room for improvement. And that's where those would be my two. They'll be my little pets. I'll have one under each arm. <laughs> <laughs> we have time now for closing statements, and we're going to go in the reverse order as we did in the opening statements. So, James Pounds, your um, closing remarks. Closing remarks. Uh, I'm James Pounds. I'm running for Boone County Presiding Commissioner. I'm not here asking for any money. I don't want you to put a sign in the yard. I want your vote. I need your vote. If you go and give me your vote, you want to go and make some changes in Boone County, you think that the taxes are too high and the, and the it cost, the cost of living in Boone County is too high. I would appreciate your vote. James Pounds, construction. Connie Leppard, your closing remarks. Thanks for allowing me to be here this evening to introduce myself. I just want to make one statement. There's only one reason why I'm running for the position of presiding commissioner, and that's because I grew up here. I'm connected to this community. I have a heart to serve. And the only reason I'm doing it is because of folks in this room and all of Boone County. I want to see you serve very, very well. I have, I have the skills, the expertise, and I have the work hard ethic to be there every single day plus to serve the citizens of the county. I ask for your vote, Connie Leppard, the <coughs> presiding commissioner of Boone County. Thank you very much. Let us show our appreciation for both candidates. They are the Republican candidates for Boone County presiding commissioner, James Downs and Connie, Connie Leppard. We're going to take a two minute break here as we reset the front panel and we'll get ready to go with our next panel going to be the two candidates that are running for associate circuit judge. You're listening to the candidate forum live from the Columbia Public Library. We are 18 days away from the primary election, which will be in early August, less than, well, less than a month away. And so we are appreciative of the candidates who are spending some of their evening with us tonight and everybody who is participating here in the room here at the library and also by Zoom and also by listening on KFRU and KOPN. Thank you for taking an interest in these races. We are doing contested races that are going to involve candidates that are directly related to Boone County. You'll have a ballot that will have a lot to choose on it because this is a ballot where you will also doing a primary for U.S. Senate and also for House. And so it's going to be an interesting ballot. It should draw, I looked at the numbers from the county clerk's website, it could be up to 40% possibly voting in an August primary with this kind of a ballot. If it had a ballot that didn't have some of these national races on it, we're looking at 6 10 to 10%. But there'll be a lot of voters on this. And one of the issues that they'll be voting on is going to be for the Associate Circuit Judge Division 10. 
These are the Democratic candidates for that position, Angela Peterson and Kayla Jackson Williams. The winner of this race will be the judge. There is no Republican candidate on the ballot in November, and I think these candidates, either one, would receive at least one vote on November's ballot to be that person. Their names will show up there, but it'll be unopposed. Qualifications for associate circuit judge. The candidate must be 25 years old, licensed to practice law in Missouri, a qualified voter, and a resident of the county of the circuit. Each associate circuit judge may hear and determine certain cases or classes of cases specified <coughs> by law. All criminal misdemeanors and infractions are heard and decided by the associate circuit judge. In felony criminal cases, the associate circuit judge conducts a preliminary hearing to determine whether there is probable cause to find that a felony has been committed and that the defendant committed it. If probable cause is found, the defendant is bound over for trial in the circuit court. Associate circuit judges also may hear all civil cases and they serve a term of four years. The 13th Judicial Court encompasses Boone and Callaway counties. There are four circuit judges and six associate circuit judges. Our candidates tonight are in the Division 10 of the 13th Court. We're going to again welcome our candidates and give them each two minute opening statement time and then we'll go through the questions. If there are questions that the audience here in the library room have, then make sure that you catch the attention of a league member and they will bring the questions to me. If you're listening on Zoom and you would like to use the chat for a question, do so and those questions will come to me also. So we'll go in the order that they are on the ballot and so that means Angela Peterson, welcome. You may present your opening remarks. Thank you. I am Angela Peterson. I am a candidate for Associate Circuit Judge Division 10. I am originally from St. Louis. I came to Columbia in 1991 to attend the University of Missouri Columbia. I graduated from Mizzou in 1994 with a Bachelor of Science in Accountancy. I graduated in 1996 with a Master of Accountancy. I graduated in 1999 with a Juris Doctor. I passed the bar also in 1999. I began practicing law in 2000 at Mid-Missouri Legal Services and that's where I spent the bulk of my career. For the last 12 years, from 2010 until 2022, I was litigation director, so second in command at Mid-Missouri Legal Services. I now work at Columbia Family Law Group. I am in court on a regular basis. I was in court just today on an <coughs> adoption case, which is actually one of the happier cases that I get to go to court on. Um, I am asking for your vote on August 2nd because I have 22 years of experience as a litigator in this community. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum, and thank you all for your attention. Angela Peterson, thank you. Now, Kayla Jackson-Williams, welcome. Thank you for being here. We'd like to hear your opening remarks. Good evening, and I'd like to thank the, the League of Women Voters as well. I heard you earlier say make sure that we speak slowly and clearly, <laughs> and already I feel like I'm not following directions, so I'm gonna try to <laughs> slow it down a little bit. So my name is Kayla Jackson-Williams. I too am from St. Louis, and I have been in Columbia for almost 10 years now. Uh, it's my daughter and I, and we absolutely love it here. It's the only home that she's known, and it's the only home that I intend for her to know. I started my career out as a family law attorney uh, before I transitioned to the public defender's office, where I practiced in every court um, room in this county. I also took conflict cases out of Callaway County um, occasionally, and occasionally I would also appear in Randolph County for other matters. I'm currently practicing in civil litigation, and I have been there since 2020. I'm also an adjunct professor at the law school where I teach client interviewing and counseling. And so when people ask me, like, what does that even mean? I tell them that I teach people how to talk to people. So I teach my students how to have interactions with clients and how to do so in a way that's meaningful and in a way that will actually have an effect in a positive way. I teach them how to put their biases aside and how to understand what someone is truly trying to translate to them without them having to truly know a person wholly before being willing to help and truly show that they care. I am a member of the Missouri Supreme Court's Commission for Racial and Ethnic Fairness,
but in particular the Juvenile Justice Subcommittee. Because Division 10 does work with the juvenile courts, that is one of the primary reasons that I am going after this seat and why one of the primary reasons I believe that I would be the perfect candidate for this role. And so I know we're gonna have a lot of questions and I just ask that you listen with open hearts and minds and really get to know us, so thank you. Thank you, Kayla Jackson Williams, and I'm trying to remind myself to speak slowly too, so we'll work on that together. We'll start with the first question that goes to Angela, Angela Peterson. What courtroom skills do you have to make a good judge? I have the skills of listening. Part of what I've done and part of what I do now is talk to people every day. I have had probably tens of thousands of conversations with clients over my 22 year career. What judges do, I think what their primary function is, is to listen. They listen to the evidence, they try to determine credibility, and they apply law to those facts. I have been in front of over 50 judges in my career throughout Mid-Missouri, um, and I have seen many different judges. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I've learned something from every one of those appearances over the past 22 years. And that what, that's one of the things that makes me uniquely qualified to be judge. Same question, what courtroom skills do you have to make a good judge? Caleb Jackson Williams. So as a public defender, I handled hundreds of cases at any given time and all simultaneously. I have had nine jury trials in this county alone and countless numbers, a countless number of preliminary hearings that he spoke of earlier. I've had bench trials in the um, family courts as well as bench trials in the adult abuse and neglect courts. I am a mock trial coach at the University of Missouri School of Law where I teach courtroom skills. And so I understand what it is to be a litigator, to be in the courtroom all of the time, to do every single stage of a trial. But I also believe that I have the knowledge and the skill base to take on any type of case with my diverse legal background and be able to um, not only listen, but show that I'm understanding the law, applying it appropriately, and doing what needs to be done in order for justice to be served. This question is gonna to go to Kayla Jackson Williams first. What thoughts or emotions do you anticipate having the first time someone would address you as judge? <laughs> so I believe in manifestation. And so because I believe in manifestation, while I'm not judge yet, I'm going to say that I will be. So I want to just hear that word all the time. So when I wake up in the morning, Kayla, you're going to be judged. So I hear myself say it all the time. And while that sounds funny and it's, it's cute, it really is for me something that you're not going to have your dream become a reality if you're not speaking your dream into existence yourself. So I know that when it actually happens, I'll probably uh, ignore it the first time because I won't believe it. But then I'll like actually realize that it is real and I'd probably just smile and just truly be happy that a dream came true. Angela Peterson, same question to you. What do you anticipate as a thought or emotion that you would have the first time someone would come up to you and say, judge? Well, the first thing that I would do would be to make sure that that person is standing up, right? So I would, I would hope to have somebody next to me that would say, everybody, please rise. Um, seriously, though, I, um, I, I would recognize it as a real honor. I would recognize it as a culmination, almost, of my service to the community. What I've done at Mid-Missouri Legal Services is represent people who would otherwise be unable to afford an attorney. And so I believe that I've shown my commitment to the community. If I then receive the respect and honor that a judge receives, I would say that I've earned it, quite frankly. Angela Peterson, you get the first uh, go at this question. What has been the most challenging legal case or one of them that you've worked on? I have worked on a lot of cases over the years. The ones that stand out to me the most are the ones where we have a child that has been a victim of sexual assault or domestic violence. The times when the judge comes down from the bench 
sits at us with counsel table and interviews that child. There are stories that you hear that only come from children that you cannot forget. And helping those families through that um, is, is one of the things that stands out to me most, just some of those statements from those children that are going through that difficult time. Question is, uh, what has been the most challenging or among the most challenging legal cases you've worked on? And this is for Kayla Jackson Williams. That's a hard question for me because as a public defender, I saw so many things come into my office. I heard Angela speak about sexual assault, and so, like, of course, those cases come to mind. And thinking of a five year old saying that daddy takes money, that phrase will forever be with me. And it is something that no parent, no, no one ever wants to hear. So, of course, that's one moment that stands out. But then I think one of the bigger moments is my very first A felony jury trial was a 17 year old charged with a felony um, and an unclassified felony and was looking at life in prison. And getting two acquittals during that trial was definitely the most amazing experience. Um, but also just the ability to connect with his mom, talk her through the process, and really let her know that I was a person who cared about her child and that I wanted what was best for him as well as justice for everyone would definitely stand out as well. We will stick with you for uh, answering the next question. It is another League of Women Voters question. A judge has latitude in establishing guidelines when dealing with children regarding abuse protection and guardianship. And you both just spoke on this matter. Those are some of the toughest cases. What in your background prepares you to make the best decisions in these complex and emotional cases? So again, I started out in family law and in my very first bench trial actually was a case where we had to deal with these similar issues. And I believe my experience in that case shaped my entire view of how that system works. And so I know that in going into these types of situations, there are factors, there are considerations that have to be looked at and I believe that I would have the ability to do so. In addition to that, um, I tell people that while I may not have as many years of experience, I have a lot of personal experience in dealing with situations such as this. Is what, while I am a single parent, I have one of the most amicable parenting plans out there in that even my child's not here today, which is really weird for me, but she's in Chicago with her dad because it's a part of our parenting plan. And it's knowing and understanding what's in the best interest of the child as, as well as the legal precedent that's set before you in making your decisions. And I know that I'd be able to follow it. For those who are not in here they are not watching, that's Kayla Jackson Williams. So now we turn to Angela Peterson. The same question, again, it's from the league. Judge has the latitude in establishing guidelines when dealing with children regarding abuse, protection, and guardianship. What in your background prepares you to make the best decisions in these complex and emotional cases? 22 years of experience handling these cases, and I've handled some of the worst cases. I have had bench trials that have lasted over a number of days because they are so complex. I have had bench trials that have involved multiple attorneys, multiple experts, um, and so I have also been on the receiving end of a lot of judgments. When a judge issues a decision, I'm the one that has to go back and explain that decision to my client. Because I've been practicing law in this area for so long, I've been around long enough to see my clients out in the community, to have their children come back, to talk to me later as adults, and everything that you learn through all of that is what prepares me to be the best candidate for the Division 10 judgeship. Andrew Peterson, you will be answering this question. and This seems to come up, and I think it's because of these forums we've, we've had judge candidates before, and it's a good question because it speaks to the fact that you two are on the Democratic ticket. I think some people are bothered by the fact that judges are aligned with a political party. And um, 
The question is handed to me, should judges be non-politically aligned so bias and opinions come into play less? I'll just ask your opinion about that, please. As a judicial candidate, I do not intend to express an opinion on that. Uh, what I will say that I have seen that it can be confusing to people as I'm out and I'm talking to the community, they want me to express an opinion. Certainly in light of the Dobbs decision, people believe that I think a certain thing because of the fact that I have to declare a party in order to run for office. The nature of a judge is that he or she has to put aside whatever their personal opinions and beliefs are in order to apply the law and to do what the job calls for. So um, again, I will not express an opinion as to whether or not this should be partisan. Um, I will just say that the nature of the job itself should be nonpartisan. For instance, the office that I'm in now, we do a lot of gender changes, and you cannot guess, based on a judge's political affiliation, whether or not they're going to accept those. I've been surprised at which judges will do them and which judges will not. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Now, Kayla Jackson-Williams, the same question to you about Running a political as a candidate with a, I'll get it, specific political party and how that factors into your thoughts about running for this position. I too will not offer an opinion on that <laughs> just because of they, I mean, honestly, as a judicial candidate, we can't speak to certain things, and unfortunately, that is one of those questions that we just can't speak to. However, I will agree with Ms. Peterson in that as a judge, you are not partisan, which is why we're not allowed to have opinions about certain things. And so while we are required to be on a political ticket in order to be elected, that does not change our ultimate opinions when it comes to deciding a case. And that's because cases are decided on case law, precedent that's set before you, statutes, and a number of other things that we have to abide by. And so as, an, as a candidate, I will say that my personal beliefs should not be a factor in whether or not I'm going to follow the law to the T, whether or not I am going to listen, care, show genuine interest in everyone who is coming before me, and truly put my best foot forward every day. Well, this question may not have an answer from either of you then, but I'm going to ask this anyway. Uh, this is from one of our participants here in the library. Can you explain how the courts need to better address and respond to individuals with behavioral health issues who are involved in the justice system? I don't know whether that uh, seems to me that's broad enough that you might, as a judge, be handling that. And uh, we go to Kayla Jackson-Williams first. I'm going to skirt the question a little bit, and I'm going to say that in Boone County, we have a number of treatment courts and a number of programs that address the issues of drug dependency, alcohol dependency, mental health issues, and I believe that these programs can broaden their horizons and have more flex to them to a sense. And when I say that, I'm thinking specifically of Callaway County, because in 2017, Callaway County developed a family treatment court. And so for Callaway County, what this meant was that they now have a family treatment court for their family court. So if parents come in with substance abuse issues or uh, behavioral mental health issues, they now have access to these same treatment services that you would have access to with the drug courts or the treatment courts, but without the criminal component being necessary. And I do believe that Boone County would benefit from something similar. And it's something that I've already discussed with Commissioner Clevenger, if elected, as well as Powerhouse Community Development and working with preparing a grant for Boone County to have that type of program because it was a grant funded program for Callaway. Thank you. Angela Peterson, should I repeat this? Yes, please. Please, okay. Can you explain how the courts need to better address and respond to individuals with behavioral health issues? 
I agree with Ms. Jackson Williams. Uh, Boone County, uh, the 13th Circuit, has been on the forefront of treatment courts, and I think we've seen it um, in the community uh, overall as a positive thing. Um, I remember when Judge Christine Carpenter began uh, drug court, and it has been a successful program. And since then, we've seen the courts adopt more and more. I think now they have a mental health treatment court. Um, so I think those programs can just expand. I will also say that I have represented a lot of people with diagnosed mental illness. I have been impressed by some judges with the way they deal with that. Um, I have been unimpressed with some judges and the way that they handle that. So because of what I've dealt with, I've represented clients who have needed, not just me as an attorney, they've also needed a guardian ad litem because of their mental capacity. Um, and so I am familiar with working with people with mental illness, and I understand that it's something that has to be addressed, and I think the court is doing a good job of that, and it should be expanded upon. I'm going to do one more question, and then we'll have closing comments, and Angela Peterson is first on this one. Share one or two of the experiences that stick in your mind that you've had while campaigning. Hmm. I have been pleasantly surprised most of the time while campaigning. One of the things that I have been surprised by is how few people, one, pay attention to the judicial races, and two, how little they know about what a judge actually does. Um, I have been asked about speed bumps. Um, I have been, um, I, I, so, so I have been um, uh, somewhat disappointed, I guess. And, and, but, but it's also been an awakening for me because a lot of times I am in this community of lawyers and we all care a whole lot about what's going on in the court. And so for me to be one of the people that gets to educate the community on that is a positive thing. And um, I hope, certainly in light of all the questions that I've had uh, in light of the Dobbs decision, I hope that that's putting it more on the forefront that we have some choice in how decisions get made. And that starts with voting. Thank you. Kayla Jackson Williams, uh, an experience or two that sticks in your mind that you've had while campaigning. I've had so many great experiences. Um, I love people. I love to talk to people, which is probably why I teach a class about talking. And I've had so many positive interactions with door knocking and canvassing and just really allowing people to get to know me. Um, one of the experiences that sticks out the most is I have a tenacious five-year-old daughter and she loves to door knock with me until her feet get too tired. And she loves to hand out the stickers. And I am just always so happy to see how many of the people in our community are so welcoming of her. And it just allows me to know that like our community is surrounded by so many good people. And that regardless of what happens um, with this race, I've met a lot of people in our community who are absolutely awesome. And their interactions with my child and I are what stick out the most because it's truly been a welcoming experience. Let's go to closing remarks now, and we'll start with Kayla Jackson-Williams. You have a minute to add anything that you haven't talked about so far, or reiterate what you have. So one of the things that I always say, I say it at the first day of class, it's something that my professor said to me on my first day of law school, who happens to be my treasurer, which is Bob Bailey, and that's that people do not care what you know until they know that you care. And I think having a caring spirit, a caring heart, and a caring... Uh, a genuinely caring nature about you will allow you to succeed in so many different ways. And I truly do care about our community. I care about the people who I represent on a daily basis. Again, I've had experience in family, civil, and criminal law. And so I truly believe that with my diverse legal background and the fact that I'm in this weird subset of uh, individuals because I refuse to be a millennial, even though I was born in the 80s, but I'm not quite Gen X. And I say that because I'm in this weird gap of individuals who are grown enough to understand right from wrong, but young enough to um, understand some of the decisions that these younger youth are making and being able to translate that to the others. And I feel like I'm a perfect gap, bro a gap 
builds gap bridge builder oh my gosh and I really truly believe that having a different perspective on the bench is going to be extremely important and having a different perspective from someone with an, an immense amount of in courtroom experience and quality in courtroom experience is going to be important Angela Peterson your closing remarks please Division 10 right now is exclusively family law. The entire docket is divorces, custody, juvenile cases. And that has been my experience for 22 years. And I want to speak specifically on that. I'm not talking to you in generalities and just saying, well, I've got a lot of experience without telling you exactly what that means. I'm being specific for a reason. That's one of the things that I do with my clients that I think is important. People need clarity, and that's my clarity. The other thing I'll say is I am a single mother of four. I am thankful tonight for my two babies being here, my youngest two children. They are all born and raised in Columbia. The oldest three are graduates of Hickman High School. The youngest just finished at Ridgeway Elementary. My daughter that's here tonight is an Army soldier, active duty. She's normally stationed at Fort Bragg. She is here because she's about, about to deploy to, I think they call it Qatar now. I say <laughs> Qatar. Um, so I'm glad that she is here. I'm thankful for her service. I have another daughter who is also in service. She is a teacher at West Middle School here in Columbia. So. Dr. Maya Angelou said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. I have shown you through my commitment to vulnerable citizens in this community, and I've done it for 22 years. I've shown it with my children now being engaged in service as well. Thank you for your time tonight. I ask for your vote on August 2nd, 2022. These are the candidates for Associate Circuit Judge, Division 10. You can apply. <laughs> Jackson Williams, thank you both. Next up, we'll have the Democratic candidates for the 47th Missouri State Representative seat in Jefferson City. We'll take a two-minute break. We are back at Columbia Public Library for tonight's forum, hosted by the library, and done a great job of doing the technical side of this and providing us the area to be. Uh, with our live audience, it is a full room, and also those of you who are watching on Zoom and those listening on KFRU and KOPN. And we also want to thank the League of Women Voters for the great job that they do of bringing these events to us so that we can have a chance to learn about those who take that extraordinary step of putting themselves out there in an election. Most of us will never do that, and it is something for them to do it, and we appreciate your willingness to do so. Next, we're going to have the two candidates on the Democratic side for Missouri State Representative for the 47th District. The um, candidates are Adrian Plank and Shemin Schwak. The winner of this race will face Republican John Martin in the general election. Each candidate is going to have time for a two-minute opening statement, and then we'll also take as many questions as we can. The library closes at 9. They like us to be out of here as close to 8.30 as we can. And I've already got a whole lot of questions for both of you. So um, we'll go as quickly as we can. But if I don't ask your question, I apologize ahead of time. We're going to start with opening comments. And again, up to two minutes on these. Adrian Plank, thank you for being here. And we'd like to hear your opening statement. Um, I'd like to tell you folks, uh, first of all, the League of Women Voters, uh, your advocacy for women's rights and uh, voting rights is commendable and you're needed and wanted and we appreciate it. Uh, I'm sure I speak for too on that. Um, anyway, I want to tell you about how I got here. Um, I had my own business for 10 years and uh, it's a construction business. I, I put granite in motels all across the United States. So I did a lot of traveling. Um, business was good. Um, you know, putting granite in motels is a, at the time was pretty lucrative. Uh, it, it paid well. Um, and the bad, the bad parts of that deal are a recession, a recession that was created by um, a banking industry uh, that was 
under-regulated and allowed to regulate themselves. Um, and so in the Bush Republican recession, I call it, um, I sp I'd spent time away from my wife, my child was young, and um, it was hard. You know, you put your entire uh, soul into business and um, your employees always came first. And I, and I truly believe if companies and corporations put their time into their employees, um, that you would have a better company. And, and so I lost that business. And I think my, my qualifications uh, stem from small business ownership and the ups and the downs as part of what can destroy businesses and, uh, and the people that they care about and their employees. Thank you. And we will move from Adrian Plank now to Shamin Schwak for her opening remarks. Good evening. First, I want to thank the League of Women Voters and Daniel Boone Library for sponsoring this event and David for coming out of retirement for, um, to host and to all the citizens that are here, both in the room, on Zoom, and listening uh, via radio. My name is Shamin Schwak, and I'm running to be your next Democratic State Rep in the new 47th House District. I say new because the 47th district covers, now covers, is wholly in, encased in Boone County and covers Sturgeon, Harrisburg, Rocheport, and West Central Columbia, which is mostly the fourth ward and a couple of slivers of the fifth and the, and the second wards. I moved here 13 years ago with my husband for our small business, and we still have that business now. Um, we have two kids, Zach and Jacob, who are here tonight. Zach is a junior at Hickman, and Jacob will be an eighth grader at West Middle. We are strong supporters um, of our public schools. We are a football family, a track family, and a golf family, which many of you um, know us from. But we are also a Catholic family that attends um, the Newman Center. And I come from a working class union family. My grandmother was um, an organizer for the AFL-CIO in um, the 60s, and she was just trying to get the same benefits for women in the factory um, as the men. And she believed in women having agency. So, and then my mother, she was a role model for my mother, and my mother, who was a retired federal attorney, was a role model for me. These women are my role models. They taught me service to family, community, and country are important, and this is why I want to be your next state rep. I've spent my adult life serving and volunteering in our community, fighting for agency and bodily autonomy, fighting for us to love who we want to love and to live in a community where we can all thrive and have living wages. And I will continue to fight for all of those things in Jeff City at the state legislature. We'll go to questions now. I want to start with the questions from the League of Women Voters. Adrian Plank first on this one. If elected, what will be your top priority on behalf of the voters in your district? On behalf of the voters? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, as far as constituents are concerned, uh, there are many, many things I want, I, I want to do. Uh, for, for instance, uh, Roseport, they've been advocating for a retaining wall for um, uh, floodwaters, uh, a cell phone tower with no equipment on it. Um, there's, there's, yes, there's um, Sturgeon who has uh, trouble keeping teachers because they can't pay enough. Um, there's Harrisburg who's concerned about their property rights and um, foreign-owned turbine transmission lines coming through their properties. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different aspects to our constituents. And I, think, and I feel like the policies that I re will, will champion will, will represent all of the district, not just one ward. Thank you. Shemin Schwak, the same question. If elected, what would be your top priority on behalf of the voters? So one of the things that when I'm out on the doors talking to people, um, the things that come up the most are, of course, the things that have been in the headlines here recently, which are bodily autonomy and agency for over 50% um, of our state. And we have a trigger law that says that 50% of our state can no longer make decisions about their own bodies. So um, while we won't be able to fix that immediately, it is my priority to um, continue to fight um, to retrieve those rights and to um, and for us to be able to 
once again, um, have a voice and have agency. Let me ask a question that the league has uh, written this way, and I'm going to rephrase it. How will you, uh, this is how it's originally written, and we'll start with Shumin Shawak on this one. How will you work to pass legislation when the Democrats are a super minority party in the legislature? I rewrote my thought earlier today. It would seem that among the requirements to be a Democrat in the Missouri State Legislature, a person would need to know how to A, manage frustration, B, handle disappointment, C, accept being of little consequence. <laughs> well, well. Um, so, uh, you know, I do not feel like I am of little consequence. And when I um, am elected, you know, right now, I already sit on several statewide boards. I'm the vice president of the board for Missouri Family Health Council. We provide um, the Title X family planning um, for the state. We serve 44,000 patients a year and work with um, uh, county health departments and FQRHCs from the Boot Heel over to Joplin and up to Kansas City at Children's Mercy and over to St. Louis. There are a lot of different folks in there. I also sit on Kids Win Missouri, which is a nonpartisan board um, also where I reach across the aisle and, and, and in work groups with people. So I believe that I am well suited to collaborate because that is what is necessary um, in Jeff City to get legislation passed and we need more collaboration. And we'll go to Adrian Plank, same question. Um, you know, I find it, uh, being as I have a family full of Republicans and conservatives and was brought up in, in, in that manner. Um, so I, I can speak their language, uh, for one. And, and, I th and I feel like, especially my sustainable farming policies, especially when it comes to um, <coughs> corporate-owned and a monopolized system, that's not conducive to a free market. Uh, you know, we got to find the issues that we agree on, um, and if we can agree, if we can, if we can agree that we shouldn't be uh, monopolizing our food industry and and and, and realizing that we need to uh, diversify our farming industry to make it more viable, uh, I I believe just that one instance alone um, allows me to speak with the Republican language. Uh, we'll start with Adrian Plank on this one, and this is uh, another question from Malik. What efforts will you make to establish a dialogue with your constituents? Say that one more time. What efforts you would make to establish a dialogue with your constituents? Um, dialogue? I, I mean, I do that every day. Um, my, my, you know, let me, let me tell you what I've been doing. Um, I've knocked 3,300 doors. I've talked to almost every targeted door in the new parts of the district. Um, and with those conversations comes a lot of dialogue. And so I, I get to learn exactly what they're thinking, what's on their minds, what their concerns are. And the conversations are fantastic. Um, and so um, they get to feel who I am as a person and I, and I get to hear their concerns, and I think that's an awesome way to do it. Shamin Schwak, your answer? So I think it's very important that our leaders in Jeff City actually listen to us and have open door policies and take our calls. We currently have um, leadership um, in, uh, in, our, in Boone County that will not take calls, that actually blocks constituents on um, social media, um, and is actually very rude in person when you try and talk to them. When I am in Jeff City, I will take everyone's calls, no matter if you voted for me or did not, whether you agree with me um, on everything or not, I will continue to hold um, town meetings. Like last week, we had a post-row discussion um, where we invited everyone um, in the community to come and have a conversation. Um, that conversation went much longer than we had planned, but. You know, that is, that is the role of a state legislature. When people come and they want answers and they want to talk, that you sit and you talk with them as long as necessary so that they feel heard. This will be uh, for Shemin Schwak first, and this was the very first question that was handed in tonight. Will you look for ways to invest in public transit, and how would you do that? So um, I am a big fan of public transit, and yes, I will look for ways to, um, for the state to fund more public transit. I think 
public transit, particularly light rail and our city bus systems um, are woefully unfunded in some places and have, we have none in others. And one of the things that public transit helps with is climate. Um, it reduces urban sprawl. People create um, neighborhoods around when there's good transportation and if they can get to their jobs easily. Um, people will ride the system instead of the bus it, instead of their cars, which reduces um, emissions into the air. And so, you know, these are ways that we can both hit climate, but we can also improve the actual functioning of our cities and our state. If we had light rail from here to Jeff City, oh my gosh. Okay. If we had from St. Louis to Jeff to Kansas City, we could all travel much more um, quickly and efficiently, and um, we would reduce actual um, traffic uh, incidents on our highways also. Adrian Plank, the same question. Would you look for ways to invest in public transit and how? Um, absolutely. Um, let me tell you, you know, a lot of people aren't happy with, happy with the, the federal government, I'm sure, right now, but I can tell you one great thing that happened, and they passed a $551 billion infrastructure uh, bill, and Missouri is going to get $9.1 billion, and that's going to be infrastructure, which is going to be transportation, air, rail, and, I, and every federal dollar that gets spent out of that has to be union labor, union skilled labor. And so as a state legislature uh, and be endorsed by Smart, Smart Local 36, Sheet Metal and Laborers, Transportation, Air and Rail, they know that I'm going to ad advocate for them and we will, we will definitely uh, bring that to, to Columbia. Um, we also need to make sure that our, you know, we, we're talking about expanding uh, 70 for, for years, lots of talk. But now that we have some money to, to improve our infrastructure, uh, we need somebody there to advocate for it. This will be Adrian Plank's question first, and while you're talking about endorsements, I've got a question from one in the audience that's talking about some confusion in regard to um, endorsements in regard to gun safety, and especially every town for gun safety. Let's talk about the uh, gun issue as far as gun rights are concerned in the state and where you fall on that and what kind of endorsements you're fi finding and, and, uh, and receiving from that. Let me first. Um, yeah, I, 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 man, such a tough topic. Um, you know, our gun laws are no different or better than Texas. And I can tell you right now, we're able to separate ourselves to some degree because of the distance. Uh, and so, when I advocate for gun safety, it will be through, you know, I'm a union carpenter. Uh, we, we get trained uh, and we get certified on, on certain things that can hurt and kill us. And we're not talking about those. We get recertified and we get retrained, new technologies. We're talking about guns and they don't even have to have permits. They don't have to have training. It's absolutely ridiculous. We do these training to re reduce the risk of injury and death. And we, we're out of control and we, and we need, we need legislation who will advocate for gun safety laws. Plain and simple. Shamin Schwak, your, your answer to the question about endorsements on the gun issue and, and what your thoughts are in that particular topic. Um, so, you know, I am a Missourian through and through. I grew up here. Um, my family are hunters. I've grown up with guns um, in my family here. And even um, on vacation, my family has an outfitting ranch in Montana. So gun safety, but gun safety is at the top priority. When you grow up with guns in a responsible gun owner family, we are taught to um, store our guns properly, lock our guns properly, um, and when out, you know, hunting to utilize them properly. But what we have here in Missouri with permitless carry, there's no reason we can't license um, guns. I'm for common sense gun laws. I don't wanna come for anyone's guns. Um, I am endorsed by um, every town for um, gun sense safety and, and that is the political arm for Moms Demand Action. Um, I'm not only gun sense candidate, a check marked candidate, um, but uh, every town has endorsed me because I have been a volunteer for Moms Demand Action um, for a very long time, for over a decade. I go to Jeff City and have been leading, um, have done lobby days um, here in Missouri. I have done lobby days um, in other states and gun, common sense gun laws are important. I have kids. I want my kids to be safe at school, at the grocery store, 
and at church just like everyone else. Shemin Schwach will have the answer to the first question, another one of the issues that is uh, heavy on the mind of some and including one in our audience, at least one, talking about school districts that have been under attack and some of the uh, responses maybe from some of the state representatives even here locally, especially the Columbia Public School District. What experience in education do you bring to the table? So, you know, our education is really very important to me. It's one of my um, major uh, platforms. I have an undergraduate degree in deaf education and audiology. Um, I have a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling and um, have, you know, with that background, I, um, when I'm looking at schools for my own children, just like everybody else, I'm looking for educational integrity. Um, I'm looking for my teachers to be certified and to know what they're teaching and, I, and to trust them. And I trust our teachers here in Columbia. Um, our legislators who seem to feel like it is um, in their purview to overreach from Jeff City down into our local school districts and tell them what should be the curriculum or what test questions should be is ridiculous. Um, we need to fully fund our school districts as state legislatures and we need to let cities who um, elect their school boards, um, let those school boards deal with local issues. All right, and uh, Adrian Plank, same question. It's talking about school districts, especially uh, people have the local one in mind. What experience in education do you bring to the table? Well, I, I, can, I can definitely tell you what, what my experiences have been uh, when it comes to the district. Um, you know, my, my daughter has gone to CPS schools from day one. Uh, she's now, a, uh, will be a junior at Hickman. Um, and I, I've also, also been a product of the, the public school system from um, all the way up through high school. I went to Central Missouri State. I am, um, um, the policies I'm gonna push. Um, as a union carpenter, uh, we've seen the attacks on our schools um, and the underfunding of our teachers in our public education system. And, We've, as Democrats, we've always advocated for that funding. So, obviously that's not working. So, like I said, as a union carpenter, I feel like teachers need to be able to stand for themselves. And I, I think it's a real damper on the system when they're not allowed to strike. And so when you lose all your collective bargaining leverage by not being able to strike, um, then that's something that I'm gonna push for at the State House. Adrian Plank will have this and we maybe have time for just a couple of questions and then closing remarks. I think this is an interesting one. I'm going to read it as it was uh, handed to me. Do you feel you will be able to fairly represent the other gender and how are you going to do that? <laughs> well, I am a, a male um, and I understand that uh, the representations uh, from women to men are going to be different. I mean, that's You'd have to be a fool not to admit that. Um, that doesn't mean uh, I'm not going to advocate for the other gender. I've been pro-choice my entire life, my entire adult life. I've got a daughter that's 16 who's just lost all her rights. I've got a, I've got a wife uh, that has a, a marina to keep down the bleeding and the, and the pain in, in her system. So am I going to advocate for women's rights? Absolutely. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I can tell you right now that... If we don't stick together on this, it doesn't matter what our genders are. If we don't work together, all of us, 70% of us, don't agree with the decision that was made in the courts. So let's be honest. If we don't work together and fight for each other's rights, then we're fools. Shemin Schwak, your question, do you feel you're able to fairly represent the other gender, and how are you going to do that? So I'm going to answer a slightly different question. I feel like I am... Um, more than capable of representing um, the gender that one that that a person decides that they are. I use the pronoun she, her. Um, we have non-binary, we have trans folks, um, folks who don't necessarily identify as she, her, um, and I believe that um, I can well represent um, all of the genders um, in Jeff City. I am, um, and I have already, uh, I've testified for um, many years um, 
on Mona. I have testified for many years, and this year I specifically testified on several bills where we were attacking families um, with trans kids and them trying to get affirming health care. Um, I think that I am well equipped uh, to fight for everyone, um, and that is important. Final question, and this is kind of a general question, but I'm just curious as to where you'll take it. Shamin Chwak, you get the first one on this. Describe your supporters. Ooh, my supporters are broad. I have a broad support, uh, broad group of supporters, I would say. Um, you know, I have a, a group of independent folks. Um, my husband is not a big D Democrat like I am, um, so uh, I've got some independents in my corner already. Um, but I would say that, you know, the makeup of those folks who are coming out um, for me right now, I have a lot of young women. I've got a son in high school, um, his friends, and the, the young women in high school who are afraid because they've never heard of having their rights taken away um, are in my, uh, support me. And when I'm on the doors, it's, you know, it's women from all ages. Um, I, I had a 96-year-old woman the other day. Um, literally, uh, she was, she was, I was taken aback because she was so mad. She was pretty much spitting um, and cussing about the SCOTUS decisions, and not just about um, abortion, but also about Miranda and about the gun laws. She was very well informed um, and just very angry. And I do have a lot of men and um, in my corner and a lot of teachers. Um, when you look at my endorsement page, there are a lot of retired, um, current and retired healthcare professionals, current and retired teachers, um, uh, some scientists, and um, you know, a couple in, in some working class young women and men who are just fed up. Same question now to Adrian Plank, our final answer from a question. Describe your supporters. Uh, my supporters are passionate. Um, they're they're diverse. Um, they're of many genders, um, and I feel like uh, a lot of my supporters are working class, dedicated family people. And um, they, they see what I do uh, and how hard I work to make change, which I've done for years. Um, and I think that's important to them. And so my supporters are freaking awesome. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't get to all of the questions that were handed to me tonight, but I, I think we uh, have a pretty good feel of our candidates. Let us uh, appreciate the candidates for the 47th District State closing Representative. Closing. Oh, closing. Closing remarks. Yeah. Well, I thank you for being here. <laughs> Shamit Schwak, you get to lead off our closing remarks. I was just trying to get us out of here. <laughs> well, my name is Shamit Schwak, and I am experienced and qualified and I will always fight for you. I am the only candidate in this primary to be endorsed by Pro-Choice Missouri, formerly NARAL, Vote Pro-Choice, the Missouri Women's Political Caucus, and the only candidate in this primary to carry the Every Town for Gun Sense Action Fund endorsement. We need eight seats to break the supermajority in the House, and the 47th is one of those seats. And we need the right candidate in order to beat the Republican on the ballot in November. And I am that candidate. I will always fight for everyone. And I just, I would like to ask for your vote. My name is Shemin Schwak. Vote for me on August 2nd. If you would like to know more about my campaign, you can look at Shemin for Missouri. That's the number four. Shemin for Missouri on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And I want to just thank the league once again. I'm a proud member of the league, and I so appreciate the years of um, these forums and Daniel Boone and once again David Lyle. Thank you. Adrian Plank, your closing remarks please. As a dedicated progressive Democrat who's helped countless candidates run in red districts um, to not win, um, I put in tons of work. I have knocked thousands of doors, thousands of doors not just for me, but for other candidates. Um, and as a person so dedicated uh, and committed to change, for the longevity that I have put in uh, to make that change, um, people know me. 
this district knows who I am. They know what I stand for. And I, and I believe I'm the best candidate for that, for that, for this, for the 47th district. And with the endorsements that I have with labor, with Moms Demand Action as a gun sense candidate, um, countless community leaders, and the ability in my fundraising abilities, and my, my commitment to the entire district. They know who I am because I've, I've seen every one of them. Uh, they know, even if they're Republicans, they know who I am and what I represent. And I, and I think that's important. And um, that makes me a representative of those constituents. And that's what I'm gonna do. Adrian Flank, Shaman Schwak, they are the Democratic candidates, 47th District. We appreciate you being here tonight. The audience is always amazing. Thank you so much for what you bring to these events also. The League of Women Voters, thank you for what you do. Lauren from the library, thank you. And your tech crew, thank you, Sharon, for getting questions to me. Tech crews and also KFRU and KOPN. The League has a voter guide for the primary election. It's available on their website. Do a search for League of Women Voters Boone County or go lwbcbc.org. And we encourage you to vote in the August 2nd election. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you.